the AI hub for business and education of the Ulysses University, European University. And, and we are today organizing a joint webinar, especially targeted for companies in Europe. So now we go into the actual topic of the webinar, so LLMs for businesses. And here, uh, this topic was chosen because uh, we found out in our fair project that many companies are really looking for advice on this topic. So on the slide, you can see at the left side, you can see the most common topics for which our company customers are looking for advice in FAIR. And, and here you see that the first is machine learning and predictive modeling. And the second already is LLMs and generative AI. And of course, we know that LLMs can also be used for classical machine learning tasks that like classification, for example. So, so this is a topic which is of very much interest to the companies at the moment. And then uh, to back up our decision on the topic, uh, we also took some um, statistics from the Statistical Institute in Finland from last year. And, and we looked at what kind of AI technologies the companies have actually implemented in their business. And, and here also we saw that uh, the most typical use of AI for businesses is uh, robotic process automation. Uh, so using AI based, based software for that. So there you have, for example, OCR technologies or automatic uh, filling of forms, for example. So some more advanced RPA than the vanilla one. Um, and then, uh, Machine learning and data analysis is the second most common, third text mining and so on. So here, as you can see, LLMs can be used, used in many of these tasks, actually in all of these tasks, you can use LLMs. And, um, and this is really a, a very, very interesting topic at the moment. Also, because it's not only uh, technology companies or computer scientists who are very into this topic, but also uh, all citizens and all types of companies are very um, fascinated by generative AI at the moment, uh, maybe because of the wide um, usage of uh, ChatGPT, for example, due to its easy to use user interface. So it's accessible now also for non-specialists. And, and you can see it also in, in Microsoft, in, in the Copilot software, for example. But of course, we have many other, other uh, models that use LLMs. Uh, so it's not only the GPT series of models, but we have from Google, we have the Gemini, for example, uh, and Anthropomorphics Cloud and so on. So there's a whole, whole family of models based on the LLM. And um, so this is some reasons for having this topic to learn more about it. And then another reason for having having these speeches and especially those that we selected uh, is that uh, there's still some, some problems when companies are implementing uh, generative AI in their uh, businesses and some obstacles. And the talks today will be addressing some of these obstacles. Um, so inaccuracy, is seen as the biggest obstacle. And for example, the retrieval augmented models, uh, retrieval augmented generation that uh, Umar Khan will be talking about, for example, is one way to address the inaccuracy issue. 
we see that cybersecurity is one, one topic which is hindering the uh, adoption of generative AI in companies, uh, intellectual property infringements, or fear of those, and, and explainability, which has to be has to do with the fact that the models are very often uh, black box and we don't actually know what is happening inside and, and if we can actually trust the answers uh, that we get from the model and so on. So I will now show you the topics of the talk, of, of the talks today, and, and then we will be going into into more details very soon. Uh, so, so after my introductory talk, there will be uh, Umair Ali Khan talking about precise knowledge access in businesses using large language models. And, and here we address, for example, the problem of accuracy uh, when using uh, large language models in, in generation. And Umar Ali Khan works as a senior researcher at Haga Helia University of Applied Sciences. Uh, after uh, Umair Ali Khan, we will have uh, a CEO Ari Heliakka from Root Signals uh, to talk about the many barriers between the proof of concepts and reliable automation. And, and about the LLMs, LLM metrics. So this will be really addressing the barriers in the adoption of LLMs. Uh, after Ari Heliakka, we will have uh, assistant professor, Dr. Eugen Schlapak from the Technical University of Kosice, Slovakia, uh, talking about um, LLM applications, beyond conventional chatbots, uh, data processing, multimodal systems, and iterative solution, solution search. So here we also are dealing with not just text, but also uh, visual inputs. And, and hence, there will be this multimodality. So going beyond the very simple uh, conversational user interface, and then uh, there will also be, be iterative solution search, and I think many, um, many other, other um, techniques also in the chatbots. And, and then as the last topic, we will then have uh, a Timo Kaski, who is the scientific officer of the Innovation Hub for Business and Education here in Haga Helia, so the users in uh, innovation hub and he will be talking about the fair edich and uh, about what it can offer to small and medium sized companies and especially in the european context so not only the finnish ones which we of course serve in in the fair um, network but um, what we also can offer to the european companies and, and the idea here uh, is that it should not be only, only the speakers listed here talking, but uh, we will have interaction here because it's a live webinar. And, um, and, and there will be 20 minutes for each talk, but then after that, uh, you will have the possibility to ask questions and to discuss um, any issues that are in your mind. So keep that in mind while listening and, and already prepare some questions while, while listening so that it will be, will be really interesting and, and that the speakers will also then address the topics that you really are interested in. Okay, but now I think uh, I, will, I will stop my talk and and we will go into the actual speeches and and the first one is uh umair ali khan from haga Helia. so please umair feel free to uh, share your slides and to start your talk
Thank you, Lily. Uh, so I'm now beginning to share my screen. Hope you all can see it. Okay. Hello and good morning, everyone. My name is Umar Ali Khan, and my today's topic is AI-driven knowledge access for business. My presentation mostly focuses on uh, the opportunities, large language models, and generative AI offers to businesses. I will start with some basics and discuss how large language models can be integrated to businesses. The major big, uh, breakthrough in the previous century was when uh, Deep Blue defeated Gary Kasparov. And in the current century, uh, the major breakthrough came when the deep learning uh, started to make stride in image recognition and other tasks. Its variants also made significant process, uh, progress in natural language processes. And uh, the, the leap learning continued to evolve and progress, but there were not major uh, progress in natural language processing. Until in 2017, Google introduced Transformer, uh, another deep learning architecture that was yet another major breakthrough. And it led to the development of large language models. And finally, in 2022, OpenAI launched ChatGPT, which was yet another major breakthrough. And since then, there has been no stopping. But inarguably, the major breakthrough in the last 10 years has been the transformer architecture, transformer with attention mechanism. So let's see how attention mechanism works. Attention mechanism works more or less in the same way as human visual processing system works. While we are reading a text, we do not pay attention to the entire text or in the entire document. We pay attention to only those words which we are currently reading, but we keep track of the context and we are able to answer the questions at any point in time. And this is the same method that the attention mechanism uses. The biggest challenge in natural language processing is understanding the context. For example, in this sentence, uh, we need to understand that the word it basically refers to the animal and not the road. Similarly, in this sentence, we need to understand that the word his basically refers to the customer and not the mechanic. Likewise, in this sentence, we need to understand that the word flies refers to the insects and not the verb fly. It is important to pay attention to important features in the natural language. Uh, and this was done uh, quite remarkably by a recurrent neural network architecture and its variants like long short-term memory architectures. So for example, in this sentence, RN, RNN are able to understand that bank basically refers to the land near a river and not the financial institution. Uh, but um, while RNN were able to capture um, good context, they were still unable to understand a long-term context in the lang natural language. This was done quite remarkably, remarkably by uh, transformers with self-attention mechanism. And uh, due to the same capability, uh, we, uh, the, the large language models can understand uh, natural language so remarkably. So self-attention mechanism basically tries to find the most important tokens or words in input text. It does this by assigning some relative attention weights to each word or token in the input sequence. And with this approach, a model is able to pay more focus on those words which are more important and focus less are little to no attention to those words which are not important. And this goes on and on uh, via a number of layers in large language models. And each layer incorporates its own context to the input text. For example, some layers identify verbs in the input text, and some layers identify the relationship of uh, various words with each other. For example, the topmost layer in this slide identifies his uh, uh, referring to John and the bank referring to a financial institution. So a large language model can have hundreds of such layers. For example, GPT-3 has 96 attention layers. So what is a large language model? 
a large language model is basically a neural network which is trained on huge amount of data and it focuses on understanding and generating natural language and this data can come from books articles wikipedia pages blogs and everything that can be crawled from the internet it requires huge amount of processing resources uh, training of several days and weeks until we get our trained large language model so large language model basically uh, is trained using a technique of self supervised learning which does not require any labeled data set uh, for example for this given piece of text the large language model masks or hides some of the text in this text uh, if some of the uh, pieces in this text and then tries to uh, predict those uh, pieces and based on the output the predicted text is compared with the original text to find uh, the extent of accuracy of prediction and based on this comparison the large language model adjusts its parameters and tries to improve its uh, prediction for the next inputs basically a large language model is a large word predictor it basically predicts the next word for a given input text and it does this by uh, computing a probability distribution of several words uh, from its vocabulary and it selects uh, the word which has the highest probability in the probability distribution like in this case it will select uh, the word right to be the next word for this sequence and it keep doing this until it completes the whole input text and the same principle is used for other high level applications such as translations chatting summarizing brainstorming code generation and others so while training on huge data set uh, the large language model uh, doesn't only parrots the training information it finds the relationship among the concepts and uh, it is the same capability that allows it to answer questions uh, related to uh, the concepts so there are a number of large language models available these days uh, especially after 2022 that is after the advent of chat gpt there has been a surge in large language models and there are more and more capable large language models being introduced maybe on daily basis a few of them most notable large language models include gpt4 gemini pro uh, cloud3 and open source mistral uh, this is the latest comparison of these large language models both proprietary models as well as open source models uh, this basically compares their relative performance and as of today cloud3 from anthropic has shown to have uh most superior performance as compared to other models so the question here is what model to select it depends on the business need and scope if you want to go for uh, multi modality you need to select any of these proprietary models which have uh, more capabilities and if you want to have more control and want to run these models locally then you can select open source mistral which has shown comparable performance so why do businesses need llm integration because llm integration allows knowledge creation capture and organization which is not possible uh, using the traditional knowledge management techniques it empowers employees for faster access to knowledge it enhances customer service by uh, analyzing customer feedback reviews and requirements it provides insights uh, to the company for improved decision making it enables the company to create tailored contents and it allows more personalization in terms of ai assistants co pilots and others so how businesses can integrate llms into their business there are several ways to do this uh, ranging from prompt engineering to pre training a large language model from scratch so let us see how each of these methods work pre training is about training a large language model from scratch using a very large data set 
and it requires huge number of computing resources, which is beyond the capabilities of most organizations. It uh, uses self-supervised learning, which does not require labeling training data set. And what we get after this training is a generic foundation model, which knows something more or less about everything, but it is not an expert model. It cannot uh, answer questions specific to a specific domain. For that, the companies can fine tune a foundation model on a specific data set using supervised learning, which requires labeling the data set and using fine tuning uh, techniques uh, to develop a domain expert large language models, which uh, can be fine tuned for a number of tasks, for example, customer support, business document analysis, financial assistance, and our onboarding assistance, just to name a few. The other technique that the companies can start with, which is the most simple technique, is prompt engineering. So prompt engineering is all about crafting a right prompt and utilizing the company's data as context with the prompt. So usually this context refers to uh, additional data of the companies, which may include companies' policies, legal documents, marketing strategies, financing, uh, and others. And it can also include examples, instructions, the style and format that uh, we want large language model to produce output in, uh, the role or behavior that we expect from large language model, and the limitations that we may impose on the output. But uh, this context is limited by the context window size of large language model. Uh, most of the current uh, large language models do have a very large context window size, but still the company's data can exceed that context window size. And once it exceeds the context window size, the large language model begins to ignore the excessive context and it may lead to inaccuracies. A more practical approach is retrieval augmented generation. In this approach, companies' data is stored in a specialized database that is called vector database. So in this database, the data is stored in the form of different chunks or vectors. Uh, it's uh, kind of a library in which the similar books are stored together. So uh, the chunks which are semantically similar are stored together. Uh, a user's query is compared with this data set and, and the top candidate chunks or vectors which have the highest similarity with the query are retrieved from this data set. Uh, these chunks are then sent to a large language model and the large language model then selects the best candidate from, this, from these chunks. And based on the prompts, it generates the final output for the user. Advantage of this approach is that it provides updated knowledge because it doesn't depend on the cutoff uh, date of the large language model. It provides personalized access to companies' data, personalized and tailored creation of content, and it is especially suitable for recommendations and matchmaking systems. But it is only able to uh, understand simple queries, and it often fails to understand um, a deeper context in the queries, and it lacks to understand the semantic relationship between the data items. A more improved approach is to integrate a knowledge graphs in the large language models. So a knowledge graph is basically a structured and interconnected view of an organization, which is built on top of existing data sources of an organization. It is basically composed of the entities that could be uh, jobs, roles, departments, companies, and others, and their relationships. A knowledge graph can provide enhanced reasoning, and it is able to understand complex uh, questions and answer those questions which require understanding semantic relationships between the entities or data items. For this simple knowledge graph, it can be represented, it can be interpreted as uh, Bank X operates in Finland, which provides loan to company Y, which is located in Helsinki, and Helsinki is the capital of Finland. So this is how we can encode information in a knowledge graph. While retrieval augment generation architectures are good for recommendation systems, uh, 
they fail to understand complex theories. This is where the knowledge graph approach uh, could be transform transformative. A knowledge graph not only performs well for both recommendation and matchmaking system, but it is also able to answer complex queries and um, besides uh, recommending uh, a product, for example, it also considers other factors such as uh, the purchase history of customer and the relationship of product with other products and others. The architecture is more or less the same as the retrieval augment generation. It is just that we need uh, some prompt engineering after a user's query to convert the user's query into graph query. This we can do employing, again, generative AI methods. So what advantages this approach uh, uh, provides is that uh, they did, the data can be validated because knowledge graph uh, provides credible and authentic sources of information. It can understand uh, broader context in the queries and the output can be controlled in the sense that uh, if the output contradicts with the contents of knowledge graph, it can be flagged for uh, reviewing. And uh, just to ensure that uh, the company's decisions are based on accurate knowledge. It also helps in mitigating biases because knowledge graph provides a structured approach of data uh, so that the biases can be uh, detected quite easily. And the knowledge graph is also able to track uh, the relationship and cause and effects of the data items so that it also provides uh, transparency. And since a knowledge graph can uh, learn uh, universally accepted symbols, relationships, and structures, so it is also language independent. So let's consider a scenario here where an employee contacts to a conversational agent based on knowledge graph and ask it for a technical problem. So the user asks the conversational agent this question and the conversational agent responds. Uh, since it uh, has already received similar complaints, so it knows what the problem is. So it refers to the knowledge graph and <clears throat> finds the relevant links that provide the source of the uh, problem. And then it crafts a response to the user. In response, the user asks another question. Uh, so using uh, the similarity of this question and its contact with the uh, previous question, uh, the, knowledge, uh, the, the conversational uh, agent again contacts the knowledge graph and finds the relevant links and provides a relevant answer to the user. So now we will discuss how uh, on uh, what could be the possible levels of LLM uh, integration in businesses. So the very first level is the prompt engineering that we already discussed. Uh, this is the simplest level of LLM integration that requires crafting an appropriate prompt and utilizing uh, the context of LLM. It seems simple, but it is actually an art and it is uh, in most cases very effective. So most of the business uh, cases um, suffice using prompt engineering. And as you can see that uh, a number of applications are possible using just uh, prompt engineering, for example, content generation, email responses, answers to FAQs, content summarization, sentiment analysis of sales and others. It does not require any te technical expertise and it can be easily kicked off with minimal resources. The other level that the companies can move to is uh, more personalization and uh, adaptation and uh, customization of LLMs. So in this level, the companies can consider about retrieval augment generation architectures, fine tuning the foundation models on their specific data sets to create domain specific LLMs. And this can lead to uh, several use cases. For example, AI assistants, co-pilots, uh, recommendation systems, matchmaking platform. And there is also a good possibility of documenting the expert knowledge. That is the knowledge that is in the experts' uh, minds. And then integrating this knowledge into large language models. But this uh, approach or level may require more expertise and resources. In the third level, the companies can move to um, more adaptation and an advanced LLM integration. 
Uh, on this level, the companies can integrate knowledge graphs uh, into LLMs. And these level also has broader range of use cases, for example, business document analysis, multimodal support, automatic resolution of complaints, customer support, just to name a few. And this is the level where the companies uh, start integrating this new system with their uh, business workflows and existing data sets. <clears throat> On level four, uh, companies can go for a complete adoption of LLMs, which is in fact an enterprise-wide integration. This is a comprehensive uh, support to employees and customer, and it provides uh, uh, enhanced reasoning, decision-making, and analytics. A number of use cases are possible, for example, enterprise-wide support, decisions, insights, recommendations, improving customer experience, and even compliance monitoring. An additional feature of this label could be that uh, it will be adaptable to new use cases. So we'll now discuss some of the ethical and technical issues that can uh, emerge uh, as a consequence of LLM adaptation into businesses. Uh, since most of the businesses are relying on these propriety models and most of these models lack transparency. They do not reveal their training data, their training mechanism, and other parameters. Data privacy can also be an issue uh, because you don't know how your data will be used for training and fine tuning these models. Performance degradation of these models is also possible because these models are under constant evolution and under experiments. So at times their performance can degrade. There are also reports of uh, frequent unavailability and unresponsiveness from these propriety models, which could be catastrophic in some cr critical applications. A good option could be to transition to open source uh, LLMs such as Mistral and others, which are making a stride these days, and they are showing comparable performance as the propriety models. And it is very important to consider the new EI ethics regulations, which will be in place uh, very soon, and it will impose uh, additional um, conditions on these models and additional rules and regulations. So they will uh, be basically more demanding in terms of transparency. So under these circumstances, the future of these uh, propriety model uh, uh, could be at stake, you know, especially in Europe. So at the end, I would like to introduce our current project, our idea that we are currently working on. <clears throat> so basically we are aiming to integrate uh, the documented knowledge as well as the tacit knowledge within a, an organization to develop an AI driven knowledge creation, capture, organization, and access system using large language models. We consider a wide range of application areas and use cases that range from customer support, sales, service design, business development, to skill management and expert search. We are currently inviting solution user companies, that is the companies that uh, will use these solutions into our consortium. Those companies who are interested in this idea can contact us for more details. So this is where I will end my presentation. And thank you very much. I will be happy to answer any questions. OK, thank, thank you, Umair uh, Ali Khan. And uh, we already have one question in the chat. And I will read it. And then you can prepare other questions while we are taking care of the first question. So the first question is about uh, the knowledge graphs. I guess it's about what can they be in practice. So the question is, uh, is the knowledge graph you mentioned in your presentation, the network of documents connected together like a wiki or a corporate wiki? So this is the question. Yes, it is more or less the same thing. Knowledge graph is basically a graphical data structure. So. Uh, it can incorporate both structured and unstructured information. So what we do basically is that we identify the entities and their relationship and then encode them in a graphical uh, format. This is what we call as a knowledge graph. Okay. Uh, hopefully this answered the question of uh, 
of JCB. And, and of course, you can put questions into the chat also. Uh, but now you can um, also speak up and ask a question if you have one. Okay, now we have in the chat, uh, what kind of partners are you looking for in, in the project that you are? So we are basically asking. looking, uh, we are basically looking for the partners which are the potential users of our solutions. So they will, um, they will engage in a core research uh, process with us uh, and our use cases will be specifically tailored to their requirements and needs. So we will first um, understand their requirements and then we will tailor our use cases according to them. So they will be the main beneficiaries of this project. So they will be the actual user of these solutions. They could be uh, like manufacturing companies, uh, uh, companies related to healthcare and well being, or co companies related to sustainability, uh, software development, and many other domains could be considered. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. Then, uh, well, I have questions, but if someone from the audience, okay, great. Which LLMs allow you to integrate knowledge graphs? There's a question. Well, it is not about any specific LLMs. So there are two approaches of integrating LLMs to, uh, uh, integrating knowledge graphs to LLM. One is uh, more or less the same as uh, we discussed, like a RAG architecture. So you can uh, integrate an LLM, a, a, a knowledge graph into LLM using a RAG architecture where you, um, use uh, a knowledge graph instead of a vector data set. So uh, you first retrieve information from the knowledge graph and then send it to the LLM for generating the final output. The other uh, method could be to fine tune uh, an LLM on the knowledge graph. So that's another approach. Um, and then we can evaluate which one of these perform better. RAG approach is more practical because it allows you to update knowledge graph frequently without retraining the large language model. Whereas if you go for fine tuning approach, you need to fine tune the large language model every time you make some updation in the knowledge graphs. Okay. Uh, so there is another question like in, uh, interesting KM project. I wonder what type of asset knowledge will be captured and how. <clears throat> In some cases, um, tacit knowledge includes some legal information, some policies that are not well documented, but they are in the heads of uh, some people. And every time, uh, based on the needs, we have to refer to those uh, experts. Um, for example, for uh, draft, uh, for creating some draft or taking some other decisions, it is possible to document this knowledge. For example, in the form of 30, 40, 50, 100 pages, 200 pages, and then we can develop a RAG architecture, uh, potentially using a knowledge graph where we integrate this uh, documented knowledge into the LLM. So instead of referring to these experts, we will be re uh, referring to this LLM system to, uh, uh, to, for, for our desired output. Okay, thank you for, for the many answers and also for the many very good questions. So, uh, well, I, I ask one question before we move on. Um, as I showed in the introductory slides, one big obstacle of not taking LLMs into use in businesses was the accuracy so that businesses feel that they cannot trust the uh, results of the uh, generative AI, we all know that they do hallucinate. And, and we also know that um, uh, typically in the, the vanilla versions do not provide the sources uh, or any explanation on how they came up with these uh, answers or information. So I was wondering if the RAGS um, models um, could be one solution to increase uh, the accuracy of the of the models so that you can, for example, put your own company data in there and maybe also show some sources to the user. Where does this answer come from? Yes, this is possible. And this is the very purpose of a RAG architecture. So 
um, rag architecture mitigates hallucination to a greater extent, although it does not completely um, remove it. There is some possibility of hallucination, but uh, it is greatly minimized. And also, it can provide uh, citations for the for the for the output. Like it can tell you which document or piece of information it referred to to generate the final output. So this is uh, the major um, advantage of using RAG architecture. Not only it provides you um, your company specific information, but it also uh, prevents hallucination, which is an inherent limitation of large language models. And then this uh, problem can be further mitigated by using these knowledge graph approach. Like I said that um, they will provide further credible sources of information. So you can check uh, where this information is coming from. Uh, you can even check what is the rationale of a cause and effect uh, because it, uh, it can track all the um, links and representation of data items and it can uh, provide you um, uh, the reasons uh, of a of a of a certain phenomena or the reasons of a of a uh, certain event so this is why knowledge graphs are so uh, useful okay thank you so i guess this is very useful information for for businesses who need need um uh, systems where they can actually trust the answers uh, generated by the generative AI. Okay, but so thank you very much, uh, senior researcher Umair Khan. And let's now go to CEO uh, Ari Heliakka from Root Signals and to your presentation. So the floor is yours. Thank you. So thank you for the, for the opportunity to, to talk to uh, an interesting audience and especially after, after the, the last talk, which, which was, uh, was quite impressive summary of, of so many facets of adoption of LMs in business usage, uh, and also provided a good introduction to, to, to many of these topics for those who are not so familiar with it. And uh, thus, uh, I'm, I'm not going to go into so many so many details on the background of a lot of use of large language models. So briefly about my background, uh, I started already in, the, in AI research uh, in 2005, and since then I have also uh, spent considerable time building enterprise platforms. So I have a bit of understanding of both sides of it, uh, and uh, also uh, re during the recent years I, I completed my my PhD of generative AI in Aalto University, and uh, thereafter I've been uh, leading uh, Root Signals, which is a startup focused on control and measurement of uh, automations that are built on top of large language models and other large AI models. So the topic of my talk today is about the barriers between the proof of concepts and reliable automation of LLM-based based systems and the key idea is that the adoption of metrics to measure the performance of these automations is the key uh, to uh, to adopt them in production environments and for a lot of business usages but not all of them but uh, i will go into into various breakdowns of how we can we can split the different kinds of uses and and how the metrics play out in, in some of them. So firstly, more, most companies now, now are already familiar with, uh, with chat GPT like usage and using uh, large language models, often chat GPT or other, other uh, newer models uh, such as Google Gemini or Recently Claude. Uh, and others, uh, they are often being used in a, in a kind of a single task basis on ad hoc uh, usage scenarios. And also uh, these, uh, these are occasionally successfully extended to create proof of concept approaches uh, to solve specific tasks. But then quite often when, uh, when they are attempted to take on 
uh, on actual uh, kind of complete uh, automated uh, context, such as actually integrating an LLM-based workflow uh, to take care of, of a certain uh, background task uh, that handles one knowledge process or or to create a reliable chatbot, then uh, we might encounter completely different technical requirements and also business requirements that uh, that the proof of concept that was previously created is actually not not then addressing. And these uh, uh, the reasons and solutions for this are what I'm going to going to focus on and were a bit alluded to and touched already on the previous presentation. Uh, firstly, let me break down these different use cases uh, or different usage categories of large language models so that we can see how automation and non-automation play out here. So firstly, we have the chatbot usage, which is familiar to uh, probably everyone on the, on the audience by now. So basically, chat GPT like usage where you, you discuss with the uh, large language models on general matters. Then another uh, use category that is now becoming very familiar uh, is the kind of what is most famously uh, called the co-pilot. So essentially, these are chatbots that are attached to a specific context. So it is essentially the same as as regular chatbot, but it, is, it has a connection to things like uh, Microsoft uh, Excel or PowerPoint or Google products uh, or software development tools like GitHub Copilot and so on. Then the uh, the next category that may be familiar to many is the concept of an agent. The uh, the agent definition is not so clear cut. I'm just giving one distinction here. You might see other ones that that might differ. But essentially, the typical uh, two two aspects of an agent, or a AI agent, are uh, the ability to achieve complex tasks and to achieve them autonomously. And this uh, this enables potentially very complex and rich behaviors to be attained, such as like scheduling appointments, managing and responding to managing email inboxes, responding to emails automatically, uh, and and so on. Uh, and we will be seeing a lot of actionable automations also uh, later this year, uh, including defining a co complex task to the agent and then agent actually actually carrying out and uh, and replacing increasing increasingly complex behaviors that humans were previously needed for. However, there's a fourth category that may uh, may fill in some of the blanks here. So it is well known that agents are often very unreliable for doing those complex automations precisely because uh, we want to push the envelope and see how uh, how complicated things they can actually achieve and how powerful things. But if we want to actually automate like single atomic tasks like like uh, consistently summarizing certain data sources or checking certain kind of issues in documents and so on, uh, then we actually just want like a, essentially an atomic task that is done reliably with the LLM. And this is what uh, what some uh, some call a, an AI skill. And that is um, basically also what uh, what we like to use to define the, the single atomic LLM based workflow entity that has a specific reliability and performance measure so that we know what it means for this specific uh, workflow to actually do what it's supposed to do. And this involves necessarily the use of metrics to, to define that. So now looking at the reliable, reliable automation, so the, essentially what we require to actually be able to implement these AI skills in a way that satisfies our, our, our real world requirements. So, uh, so we have uh, typical barriers like fundamentally unpredictability, uh, which is uh, based on the very nature of large language models. This is uh, the unpredictability stems both from, from the fundamental uh, way in which these models are, are created and then because there are user inputs that we generally cannot predict. So the most typical, one of the most typical failure scenarios for chatbots is that basically people are just asking questions that, that nobody even thought of, of, of uh, testing during the development phase of, of this AI skill. Uh, it is also worth emphasizing that the traditional ways of software testing 
are not directly suitable. So in traditional software testing, you design a software and then you you can you can add the tests uh, towards the end of the process. Some people add them uh, add them pedantically at the beginning, but often this is uh, put put in as an afterthought. However, the case of LLMs is such that actually you need uh, the tests to be there uh, from the very beginning if you want to guarantee uh, or at least uh, uh, do do your best at guaranteeing the the appropriate behavior because you are dealing with a black box that you didn't and nobody did design. Uh, and uh, and finally, of course, uh, the very nature of uh, actually uh, defining this task is indirect. So it, it is uh, it is not clear what are the nature of potential issues that could arise if you if you, for example, let let the potential users user discuss with the chatbot about possible products and and uh, you you haven't actually told the, the bot like necessarily what kind of things it's supposed to talk about or or not, or if you did, you might not be we might not have predicted all the possible things that the users might uh, might be talking about with, against your desire as as a as a business owner or as a technical owner of of this AS field. So these um, these are then uh, basically the the, the sa same e challenges that uh, that are just e expressed from from technical perspective as the, the statistical nature of language models, the lack of self reflection, which just follows from that uh, that technical uh, technical aspect of training it in a certain way by predicting the next word. So the model simply cannot go back and, and look at what was the previous word in a, in a kind of self-reflective self way as, as humans can. So this is a fundamental limitation. There's a way to overcome this by, by chaining together these calls or, or asking the, the model to actually evaluate what happened on the previous step. So that can be done later on, but on a single single query, this, this cannot be done. And then what, what we are least aware of are all these implicit implicit requirements that we actually would expect of a language model. And we don't usually think about this when we deal with humans, so that sort of common sense uh, context is completely missing, and then it needs to be filled in after actually empirically trying out the, the behaviors first. Now, the general approach to, to mitigate and control these issues is by adopting metrics that actually uh, actually observe certain kinds of behaviors. Uh, so a few examples of things that can go wrong are on, on for example, the categories of safety. So we are most of us familiar with these, these issues that, uh, that the creators of last language models are trying very hard to prevent. These are, this is called the alignment problem. So preventing the model for, from uh, replying to, to questions in a way that would be uh, unsafe or cause, cause harmful, harmful consequences, whether it's uh, related to the to the person uh, him, himself or herself, or whether it's related to asking about how to create weapons and these kind of things are then dangerous on a, on a wider societal scale. Then we have these uh, various issues of biases, which is a really difficult problem and has also some political aspects to it. Some people uh, are probably aware of what happened with the Google Gemini, uh, recent release where it was uh, essentially uh, recasting historical uh, figures uh, in in all kinds of uh, di diverse human types, even when those people were like uh, very very specifically and clearly of of white origin, and then uh, the kind of the attempt to mitigate the biases had had actually created another very specific kind of bias, which then resulted in a in a big backslash for for a Gemini team, and. Then, of course, we can have other kind of harmful answers that might be such specific to your business context, like uh, the you, you have a chatbot uh, that is supposed to reply to questions about the product, but then actually it might start recommending your competitor's products, which is usually not intended for, for the, in the business context unless you're a non-profit. And uh, the way to, to address these various uh, shortcomings uh, in addition to the structural methods that were discussed on the previous talk that relate to uh, like using retrieval generation and training methods and all, all these uh, these 
technically involved approaches uh, as well as prompt engineering. Uh, those uh, in addition to do those development stage uh, methods, we can add what we call evaluators, or they can be called LLM metrics that uh, actually look at the, the performance of the of the LLM automation or the AI skill uh, when it's being run in addition to when it's being developed. And some typical categories of, uh, of metrics uh, are listed here. So there are things like, uh, like measuring the truthfulness of the answers and measuring uh, the relevance and topicality, staying on topic of the answers, uh, as well as things like uh, actual compliance to certain policies. So does the answer actually break some uh, some regulation rules uh, that, that the company or the, the model or uh, the chatbot or the uh, LLM skill owner should, should adhere to and so on, as well as adhere to the business requirements. So all these things can be measured and we can add, add boundary conditions on accept on uh, what those measure, measures uh, uh, output. So basically, if the, for example, the risk for toxic answer is above certain threshold, we can stop that from being shown to the user. And the same logic applies to adherence to certain policies and so on. So we can stop the replies before the user actually sees them based on these metrics. Uh, then uh, there are other aspects, of course, uh, to the governance of, of the model behaviors, just a regulation uh, aspect. But then there's this online monitoring and observability aspect. So you need to be able to, to not only follow these measures when you develop the, the AI skills, but when, when they are, once they are launched to production, you need to be able to observe what happens when you get real inputs from real users or, or data sources that are updated. Maybe your AI skill could be tied to certain kind of news outlet, uh, for example, or a company feed and suddenly there's something that you didn't expect. Uh, and suddenly the model makes, uh, makes gives some kind of like super weird and misleading response. So these things need to be handled. And, and for really impactful decisions also required by certain regulations, you actually need to have a human in the loop to actually check the response before they are sent to the end user. And then we have this, uh, this difficult issues of explainability and transparency where maybe the most uh, one of the most deceptive part is that the models are very good at, very good at explaining what they did, except that the explanation is completely like fictional. It's also a similar feature as as what humans have. And finally, you should be able to intervene uh, and figure out what were the causes of problems and make changes to the AI skill later when you when you find them. And and the behavior of the models uh, should always be auditable so that you, you see what, what, happened, what took place, which model version was, uh, was being used when something happened, uh, and see, see uh, the worries and the response pairs. So there's essentially two ways to, to control uh, the models, uh, like sort of uh, con two conceptually different ways. So one is to look at the kind of what, what are called like guardrails, so this is essentially putting a boundary around the behavior of the model that needs to stay within certain boundaries. So this can be also be qualitative. It doesn't have to be like actually metric, <laughs> actually metric. So it could just be a classification like, is this answer uh, good in, so, in so, some sense, uh, acceptable or not? But then on a more general case, you would like to have, uh, have metrics so that you have actually some numbers that you can optimize against and you can, you can see how they change over time. Uh, like like in the example Im image shown here, there there's uh, there are certain validations for her certain requests to certain AI skills that are on screen and some that are are actually on the red and some actually are so suspicious that they are being blocked and so on. And you can use the the fully described business intent, which is a human description of what your what the AI skill is supposed to do. Which is kind of an intentional description of the of the task, and then this uh, uh, set of evaluators uh, that you put on top of that, you actually extensionally define and constrain the behavior of the model, and then the whole task has been defined, or the whole AI AI the, the whole purpose of the AI skill, the business objective. So finally, uh, the general takeaways for adopting a metric for reliable automation in production environments. 
Firstly, you need to have both these online evaluations, which happen in real time when users are actually using it, and then the offline evaluations that you do before that when you develop develop the uh, your your AI skill or automation or agent. And uh, they are used in different ways. Some some things you can only do offline and and uh, less and, and on the other hand, in online scenario, you need to be uh, be uh, even more aware of things like uh, cost and latency and actual real time performance issues. And the the second takeaway is that the ways in which the LMS LLMs fail are largely counterintuitive until you really go deep for a little deep into this topic. And, and therefore, it's it's good to start from from existing checklists or existing systems that already have like a categorical approaches to control and and uh, measure these things that that are typically the typical uh, failure modes of, of the model behaviors. And finally, there are tools already to to address this. So there are various guardrail tools. Uh, there are evaluation tools. Uh, other com uh, other providers like Microsoft and Google have some some tools towards this. Then there are tools from, for example, N Nvidia. There are some startups uh, like Guardrails. Then there's uh, our company Rootsing us working on this, uh, and and certain uh, various academic groups and nonprofits are also looking into these things under the general heading of AI safety. And uh, the the two two aspects uh, that might lead to different directions is like just looking at those guardrails. Uh, which is more about constraining uh, the behaviors to to be within uh, acceptable param parameters, and the other aspect is actually measuring the performance, which can then be turned into into also guardrails as a as follow up. Thank you. This was uh, this was uh, the summary of the most important topics that that we think that conceptually are preventing the or hindering the adoption of of LLM based automations that are that we call AI skills uh, to be used in production in in real real world scenarios and uh, this is then hopefully serves as a starting point of your journey to actually uh, start working working on these topics when when you release you know, automations in uh, in in context where real people are are using them out there in the public thank you okay <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Ari Heliakka, for the very interesting talk. Uh, it's time for questions. We already have one in, in the chat that I will read. And meanwhile, the audience can think about other questions to Ari Heliakka. So the first question is about, um, well, I just read it. Uh, unlike supervised learning, where you know precisely what the model is supposed to output, Natural language outputs require a more complex accuracy metrics. So what metrics can you see to establish that the output of an LLM outside of human subjective evaluation? So this is a very interesting question because uh, you can, I guess, also see it in the chat. So, uh, so what is your take on this? Yeah, so, so so the main distinction, if we think of this in contrast to supervised learning, so in supervised learning, you have a situation, you have the setup where uh, you know that for 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 this given question, like like uh, who who is uh, like let, let's say that uh, uh, what what is the, the interest rate uh, on this uh, on on the car loan of 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 this uh, specific specific bank. You, so you have a clear, clear reply that the, the interest rate is this and that, and uh, the, so this is the and and you can also have a negative example in supervised learning scenario uh, where you know what you can define also what the wrong answers are, but usually the focus is on the on the positive ones. So the uh, and in LLMs because you cannot know this, uh, there's uh, there's two ways that are closest to the supervised learning. Uh, scenario that you can use so one is that you can give uh, uh, give what what is called uh, in context examples uh, so you can uh, you can guide the model to actually give uh, examples that that uh, you can guide the model to towards 
correct answers by giving examples uh, uh, in the prompt itself. But to actually determine if that if that were so, you can create uh, sets of examples that can be later uh, matched against based on similarity, so that uh, if the question was similar to this question uh, and the answer is uh, then the answer should be similar to this uh, answer. And then you can use what is called the uh, vector-based uh, similarity measures to or semantic similarity measures to see if the answers are far, if the answer is close to what what should be expected. However, this is this is very narrow, uh, and if the users uh, ask something that is out too far outside uh, these uh, similarity metrics capabilities based on your samples, then this is not very helpful. The other the other similar possible the other kind of uh, uh, appro approach is what, what can be called like a predicate based predicate means basically some property so then you just define that the answer when the question is of this kind the answer must be that kind so if the question is about uh, about uh, car parts then the answer should probably also be about uh, about car parts or some other car properties and not about horses for example so you can do this kind of uh, control on the semantics of the answers. I'm not sure if this is helpful, but the real answer is that there is no direct correspondence to supervised uh, like the supervised training uh, objective in the in the evaluation part. And this is the uh, closest that we can get is by looking at examples or looking at these like descriptions that that uh, the fulfillment of which we can measure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for the for the answer. And um, now we we have some time for other questions. I could maybe do a, a follow up for with this question. While others are thinking, you can also put into the chat, or you can also speak up now. If yeah, let me let me also add that of course the question of truthfulness comes back to this. So if you are if we have a retrieval of many generation scenario where we do have some reference data, like let's say we have a product document that is being used, then in that case we can actually go deeper and then we can directly evaluate the truthfulness of the answers against the reference data. So that is possible. That also uses vector based uh, uh, vector based uh, similarity measures to to do this uh, this cross comparison and measure the truthfulness of the answer if we have the reference data available. Mm. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, well, yes, and, and this is really a very good issues that you bring up, Ari Heliaka, while really measuring the accuracy of, of these uh, LLM based systems is really a challenge because, like the person who asked the question said, in the world of supervised learning, we had the training data, which was labeled, and that required lots of human labor uh, to, to label the training data. Now we are in the world of unsupervised machine learning, where we don't need any labeled data. And, and this makes this so we can use lots of data because we don't have to do a manual intervention into it. But then we encounter the problem while being in the evaluation side, because then again, like you said, Ari, uh, this um, reference data, that is data that is curated by humans. So so then there are really some, some there's some room for innovation in the metrics side, how to reach automation there and, and not to require the manual labor at that side to be able to evaluate the results of the models. So, um, so, so that's really, really very interesting. Interesting. And then I was wondering about the, there are some incident databases uh, wh where these are recorded, where you record all the incidents that happen while using LLM based uh, systems. So do you see that, would these incident databases be somehow helpful also in these metrics or somehow helpful for the evaluation of some system or not? What is your take on that? Yes, uh, in, in a few different ways. Maybe the most important one is that uh, that you can use uh, 
illustrate you can use these as illustrated examples that uh, that you can actually provide e even in the prompting phase you can provide it to the model so especially now that the context windows uh, are becoming bigger meaning that you can write very long prompts uh, to uh, to assist the, the model for each query uh, it allows us to say like specifically we can literally say to the model that that hey here is the general instruction of what you're supposed to do and if the user asks about this don't answer this or answer it uh, or avoid making this specific mistake and it and this actually works really well of course uh, you cannot do this for every possible error but especially if you know that that there are these three incidents that keep keep happening these these, these typical problems you can explicitly guide the model to avoid those of course if you find some smarter way to say that okay this whole category of this kind of thing is you should never address or you should just always say i don't know to the model so this is this is one one of the key ways and then of course what i didn't touch was the the fine-tuning scenario so if you have the luxury to actually do the fine-tuning which is different from from engineering as discussed in the previous talk as well but if you have the luxury to actually Fine tuning the model uh, to permanently uh, behave differently. So you create this fine tuning layer on top of the model, and then you can create your AI skills uh, on top of that fine tuning layer. Then for that fine tuning, this uh, incident uh, data, or rather uh, this uh, real time uh, usage data where you have good responses and bad responses, you can turn this into a training data for the fine tuning process. And then uh, that, that should also provide you with a more, more permanent permanent uh, solution. But because of the the, the, burn, the burden of fine tuning uh, is so much higher than actually changing the prompt, then that's usually like your, your first stop is to, your first step and stop is to, to start from improving the prompts. And then when you have a lot of examples and you have the luxury of spending time on the fine tuning and dealing with that, and you want, are you sure you can, and you're sure you can maintain that, then you can uh, use that for a more permanent solution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes, thank you. I think this is really very, very good, good advice for this, um, increasing the accuracy and reliability and trust in the LM, LLM-based systems. So this is really very, very essential information for companies that are taking these technologies into use. So now we have have um okay there is one one more question in the chat about um are there suitable metrics towards explainability of the llms you you can craft these metrics uh firstly you can you can literally ask the model to justify its answers that's uh that's kind of the starting point and uh, point uh, get like getting the surface level explanation but like i mentioned the problem with this is that uh, it, it's nearly not the case that the model uh, follows a certain kind of path and then it arrives at the answer and then it would go back and explain how it actually in reality did that because it, it's completely unable to do do that and we are also unable to do that as humans in reality we know that we can confabulate these explanations like i can say why I, why i did things i did this morning or what i did during the last hour by explaining but it's not really the case that i did it for that reason that has been shown by various psychological experiments the similar thing with the llms and uh, there are there are a lot of there's a lot of research in explainability, but usually that all those uh, are focusing on simpler systems, and then they put some constraints on the on the models, uh, like really hard uh, and and uh, uh, almost uh, well well kind of unrealistic constraints for many real world scenarios, so that they can force them to be explainable by certain ways. But otherwise, uh, in terms of evaluations. Uh, what what we can uh, we can simply just ask what the explanation is. We can use another model to judge that explanation, uh, and uh, we can also use certain methods to to judge the variance in those explanations, which goes into a more uh, more depth. But this is 
more like a research topic than something that we can uh, we can say that as a as a reliable and consistent measure. Okay, thank you very much for the for the answer and and now we have to move to the next very interesting topic in this webinar. So thank you, Ari Heliaka, very much for the for for the presentation and and thanks for the audience for the great and interesting questions. And and now we have Eugen Schlapak from the assistant professor from the Technical University of Kosice coming to tell us about multimodality and chatbots and other issues. The floor is yours. Thanks. Uh, thank you for the op opportunity to uh, speak at this event. Now I will share the Okay, I can, I can share the whole screen. So do you see the slides now? Okay, great. So uh, I will talk about the uses of a large language models and large multimodal models, uh, which work with multiple modalities, uh, like uh, primarily images or even uh, videos. Uh, and I will not talk about uh, some interactive uses like uh, chatbots and so on, but about non-interactive uses uh, that uh, do some processing on uh, data, uh, mainly on text and images, or uh, search for some solutions uh, iteratively. So uh, main topics will be uh, suitable problems uh, that can be effectively used uh, with these models. Uh, then I will talk about uh, typical tasks that we can do on uh, this data during the data processing. Uh, I will talk about uh, solving some problems uh, that are uh, present in these models like uh, hallucinations, about improving outputs with various techniques chain of thoughts and fused prompting uh, that was already uh, mentioned by Dr. Haley Uh And uh, finally, I will talk about uh, approaches uh, that um, I call iterative approaches. Well, it's uh, an umbrella term uh, that includes uh, iterative division of large inputs into smaller chunks. Uh, some uh, other approaches like tree of thoughts so some branching of uh, various ideas uh, proposed by the, by the large language model. Uh, and then prompt optimization and multi-agent frameworks in which uh, agents communicate between uh, each other and uh, try to solve the task uh, collabor collaboratively. Uh, well, um, large language models learn by uh, training on uh, huge uh, data sets. So uh, LLMs that only work with text uh, learn on a huge uh, 10 terabyte uh, file. I mean the largest models, of course. The small, smaller models could use like some smaller data set, but the state of the art uh, models um, train on uh, these huge amounts of data but the final weights, final train weights are 10 to 50 times smaller. So if they, uh, if these models have to uh, provide great performance uh, with token prediction, they cannot just memorize everything. So they learn how to simulate processes that uh, generate these tokens. So if there is some, uh, text written by human, they are learning to simulate humans uh, and particular like roles that humans can have. Uh, but also if they see some text generated by uh, command line terminal, they also learn to emulate the terminal. Uh, so uh, you can also uh, try to talk with uh, some chatbot uh, and ask it to emulate the terminal and it is uh, entirely cap capable to do so. Uh, there are also, as I have mentioned, multimodal models 
uh, usually uh, they take text plus some images uh, as their input. And you can provide some commands uh, both as text, uh, but also in images. So you, for example, can highlight some parts of the images and uh, use it as part of the command. And usually they output the text and uh, you can try these models for free. Here are some uh, examples like Microsoft Copilot or uh, Lava 9.5 uh, demo and so on. Uh, but there, there is also Gemini 1.5 Pro uh, that can work with uh, video input. So you can ask it, uh, for example, to um, find some part of the video in which someone, for example, steals something from a store shelf and uh, similar uh, task. Uh, it mainly excels in uh, um, in a needle in the haystack problems when it uh, needs to find some particular moment in the video and it can be like uh, quite uh, abstract um, ex abs abstract action. Uh, so I uh, usually think uh, when I when I try to come up with some problems that I that are suitable for these models, I usually think about the level of abstraction of problems. So uh, when we have uh, problems that are not very abstract, like determining brightness of the image, we can use a uh, simple regression model or even handcrafted program. Uh, for medium abstraction uh, problems, uh, where uh, there may be um, there may be some uh, features that are a bit more general. For example, each cat may look make look different, but uh, they all refer in our minds to the same concept of a cat. Uh, we have models for that now, of course. We have uh, convolutional neural networks for some time. So these are able to solve these problems, but, but then we have even more abstract problems. Uh, for example, if we have image of some dangerous situation, uh, well, we could try to train the convolutional neural network, but uh, we would uh, run of examples quickly. And uh, there are billions and billions of way, uh, ways in which the situation can be dangerous. So there's typically a very long tail of uh, possible uh, edge cases. Uh, of possible uh, edge cases uh, that uh, happen in these abstract situations, and they can be all classified as dangerous situations. Or there are a billion ways in which the room can be uh, messy, and we cannot simply take some data set and um, be happy with even like 100 million examples, because someone uh, will come with uh, another example, like how to make the room messy. Uh, and this is uh, uh, the image on this slide is example uh, that I have tried just yesterday. I, ha I have even made a, um, a typo uh, mistake there. So I have written situation instead of situation and model handle is just uh, uh, right. So we can see that it can understand this abstract, abstract situations. Well, uh, now I will talk about uh, typical examples um, of data processing. So we can uh, we can do some classification data uh, that's assigning some discrete, discrete labels, uh, either to text or uh, to the images. Then we can do, uh, we can solve some uh, regression problems. So uh, for example, we can take some quite abstract measure and assigned numerical value uh, measured in this measure, measure to uh, individual samples. So in this case, I'm measuring quite abstract metric that is a truthfulness of some statement. And the statement is, uh, by the way, I will use this color notation. So uh, the blue color will be for LN outputs and orange for inputs. 
And I'm measuring a truthfulness of this statement. And uh, we can see that the Earth is not a perfect sphere. So it assigned 0 0.9 and not 1. Uh, and finally, we can also extract some uh, structured data from unstructured data. So in this sentence, it is not like explicitly stated uh, that the person was born in particular city or uh, that the person is uh, old, like 42 years, uh, but uh, it can be somehow inferred from the context with general, um, with uh, common sense reasoning. But there are also problems. So uh, LLMs for various reasons do not have uh, as great performance as uh, humans, at least uh, without a large number of uh, measures taken to improve their outputs. So uh, the first problem is that they hallucinate. Even if they give the correct answer nine times out of, out of 10, uh, because they are stochastic, the 10th time, they can just hallucinate the wrong answer. And if we ask them if they tell the truth, uh, they um, usually, uh, well, they, they can admit that uh, they did not provide correct information, but uh, usually they don't. So we cannot um, rely on, on their responses while uh, detecting hallucinations. We can use uh, some other approaches to detect them. For example, if we have a limited number of classes and we have asked to classify into one of these classes or we uh, have just like binary classification uh, into uh, the class true or class false, uh, we can look at probabilities of these tokens or these individual classes that should be among the top tokens uh, suggested by the LLM. So as Dr. Khan said, uh, LLMs work by predicting the next token, like probabilities of uh, the next candidate tokens based on all the previous tokens they have uh, in uh, user input and also the tokens they have previously generated. So if we have access to these probabilities, we can take a look how confident the model uh, is about its answer. So if we get a linear probability of 99% that the next token is a uh, token for the word true, if it's binary classification task, uh, then we can be sure that it does not hallucinate. However, uh, there could still be a bias. Right, so um, that is another topic that, that can be uh, fixed in some other ways, but uh, we can be quite sure that it doesn't hallucinate. Uh, but if uh, there's 60% probability for the token true, uh, for example, then the model is not quite sure. If we do not have access to these probabilities, or uh, we cannot just look at the next token. Uh, so it's not like simple classification task and so on. In these cases, we can look at self-consistency of a model. So if there is no conversational memory, uh, it's not influenced by its previous um, responses, it does not remember uh, how it hallucinated last time. So uh, if the model is not sure about the answers, these probabilities I have mentioned on, on the last slide uh, will uh, manifest themselves when we are sampling individual uh, outputs from the model and it will respond significantly different each time. So significantly different values or if we take the text, uh, some paragraphs, it has generated then significantly different embedding vectors that describe meaning in this text. And what can, what can we do with these hallucinations when we have identified them? We can pass uh, these cases with uh, hallucinations where the model is not sure 
the human evaluator, or we can use more powerful LLM if we want to save, uh, the, like decrease the costs and we use less powerful model, but it hallucinates for some cases, we can pass them to more powerful LLM. Uh, or we can directly do some majority voting and similar uh, approaches to just get the most likely result. Uh, also, uh, unstructured output is not that useful. And uh, we, uh, in conversations when uh, responses are read by humans, okay, they are okay. Uh, but when we want to uh, base some program logic or uh, measure accuracy of classification or and so on, then we need a structured output. And it is not uh, always um, like uh, the model does not always uh, obey uh, if we ask it just to provide the structured output. So there are libraries that do just this. And uh, we don't have to uh, verify, uh, like uh, write some code to verify JSON uh, structured output from scratch or resend the failed responses and so on. Uh, also, uh, there is uh, future prompting. So we can provide a few examples for the model, how the outputs would uh, look like. And it, it can help to. Um, it can help to somehow calibrate the model. So we can say that we want to, for example, the right uh, the ripe apple uh, to have the some abstract uh, subjective sourness of zero point four, and uh, lemon be at the, uh, the the highest value like of the scale. Uh, and thus we can. Um, yeah, calibrate the model to more closely follow the function uh, for regression or classification uh, like as we want. So it does not go as far uh, from our desired uh, outputs. And it knows that if something is less sour than Apple, that uh, then uh, we want it to provide some lower values like 0.3 and so on. Uh, we can also do future prompting with uh, LMMs. So uh, visually, we can provide few examples and outputs, and uh, we are more likely to get correct answer in that way. Then there is chain of thought. So we can ask the model to think about the answer uh, before uh, providing the final answer, and this. Uh, generate some intermediate thoughts or intermediate uh, calculations. So uh, we can ask it, uh, this is some uh, real experiment I did, like I, I was asking the model if the wooden spoon is edible, and it told me that it is edible because uh, I asked it to uh, output just a single class, <clears throat> either uh, edible or inedible. Uh, but if we ask it to reason a bit about it, then it can uh, provide the more correct uh, answer. So it looks at all the previous tokens and uses them as some intermediate uh, reasoning or intermediate calculations. Uh, that is uh, why the order is also very important. So uh, we should first provide the reasoning and only then the category in our structured data, uh, not the other way around. We can also do a visual chain of thought prompting. So we can let it uh, think about uh, objects in the image for a while and uh, use it to provide the final answer. And uh, we could also do uh, fine tuning, uh, low rank adaptation, five fine tuning is easier than full fine tuning of all model weights. It can even be done on consumer hardware, even though we need two consumer RTX 3090 cards. Uh, and we can even fine tune um, 
visual like multimodal models like lava mat that was fine tuned for biomedicine. And also we need the data set. So yeah, that, that's the downside. Uh, it's also a good idea to divide um, uh, large inputs into smaller parts and just uh, process a smaller chunks individually, like individual sentences or um, paragraphs. Then another theater approach is three of those that it come out with different solutions to the problem, different responses, and then branches of them, and uses LLM itself to evaluate quality of these thoughts. Then we have automated product optimization. So uh, we do not have to write uh, instructions to the models ourselves, but we can do this loop that self evaluates quality of responses of the model and somehow mutates uh, these prompts. And there are also multi-agent frameworks that are most expensive, but uh, also most capable because uh, they um, iterate on a problem for a really long time and there are different roles and uh, different, uh, okay, I'm sorry about the sound, uh, diff different, uh, um, different agents and they have uh, different roles, uh, different, there are different hierarchies in which they can collaborate and uh, they can use different uh, tools. So uh, this is also, uh, uh, I, I think like uh, according to some benchmarks like a human eval for uh, evaluation of uh, like some uh, coding problems, it's a coding benchmark uh, like at the top of the leaderboard, there's some agent-based framework. So very strong approaches. Okay, thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much for the very uh, interesting talk covering in depth many topics. Um, so from the business point of view in, in depth. Uh, uh, so um, I have questions, but uh, of course, if the audience has, I prioritize them. Um, you can put into the chat as well. Uh, I, I start because I was very interested by the chain of th thought um, approach. Uh, so to make visible uh, a reasoning path in, in, the, in the system. So uh, now if, if, for example, a business wants to take into use uh, that kind of outputs, uh, for example, in some conversational agent that they are launching for end users, uh, what would be needed? Is it prompt, in, prompt engineering or what would they need to do to take this technology into use? Yeah, so the simplest way to use chain of, pro, uh, chain, chain of thoughts is just to ask the model to think step by step. Uh, that is the uh, like the simplest approach that can be used in any chatbot. Um, for structured data, uh, we have to uh, like provide um, a separate like data field that will be generated with all this reasoning. And uh, it is very important to realize that it's not a waste of tokens and the money, like all this. Uh, uh, reasoning data, even if it will be thrown away, right? Even if if uh, it will not be used in uh, the final output data that we want to use for some classification and so on. Because maybe like uh, some people will tend to uh, dismiss uh, those like reasoning data as wasted, but but we 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 um, we have seen that uh, they are very very useful as those intermediate calculations. Um, so uh, I have I've shown the use of fusion prompting to show um, how specifically it should think, uh, how specifically it should think during uh, during the reasoning. But we can also um, ask the model to think about particular aspects of the problem we are interested in. Uh, and uh, use that as intermediate um, 
intermediate reasoning or intermediate calculation. So we can force the model to think about uh, things. Uh, we, want, um, we want it to think uh, for each individual sample. It should do the classification for. So we can ask it um, if, if it is, uh, I, I don't know, if, if it is uh, going to um, uh, biographies of some people, we can ask it to think specifically about some particular aspect of their biography. Uh, and uh, then we can uh, do some additional checks, like how much does it help the classification or how much does it help the regression? So uh, we, can, uh, we can just uh, force it to take these reasoning patterns that are more useful. Okay, yeah, interesting. Um, okay, then I'm looking at the chat to see see more questions. So thank you for, for the answer to that one. I have to also check that one myself uh, later. Um, but then there is a comment maybe rather than, than a question in the chat that about mixing the concepts of, uh, of chain of thought and attention in transformers uh, that you can mix, that it's like mixing water and oil. You can't expect inductive reasoning using attention. Do you want to comment on, comment on the comment? Uh, can take a look at the comment in a second. Yeah, um, okay. yeah it's in the, in the chat. So, so, uh, or if, if someone in the audience wants to have another question or uh, or or participate in, in this discussion. Okay, I, I will not uh, comment on that. that. That is possible. I would uh, need to uh, do some more research, like or um, have a fun good uh, answer about it, like some good arguments. Yeah, I think at least this uh, chain of thought has, I think it has a practical interest, interest because it, it makes the reasoning reasoning uh, available. And I think that was one, one of the most important concerns uh, in taking into use the LLMs. So, so but um, yeah, so, so I think it's, it's an important topic and uh, also maybe not so much yet not so widely in use. So it's, it's good to bring this up, that reasoning is also possible. Okay, yeah, yeah, I know it's, it's, <laughs> it's really, uh, really very, very challenging topic. Yes, yeah, yeah, of gener general intelligence. Yes, and not the narrow one that technical people to often Focus on. It also depends on on the definition, like uh, of the general intelligence, because there's there's not like a single definition, and uh, I personally uh, like uh, like like to look uh, how well can the model generalize uh, beyond the data on which it was trained for. So, for example, if we give uh, arbitrary room layout to uh, these LLMs. It can work with layouts it has never seen before. So maybe it's a quite low bar, but uh, I tend uh, to look at that quite a lot, like generalization beyond the training data. Mm. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I, I'm afraid because uh, of time, we have to stop the very interesting discussion that just got started and move on to the next presentation by Timo Kaski. But feel free to continue in the chat or then by emails, but uh, we have now, now Timo Kaski, the scientific officer of the Innovation Hub and also the project manager of PEAR at um, Hagahelia. And um, we will be sharing the slides here for, for the FAIR, um, FAIR presentation and what it has to offer to Finnish companies. So go ahead, Timo. Yeah, thank you, Lilian. Thank you. Um, 
Thank you for the interesting presentations and discussions and questions, comments, everything. So I think we are all learning together and, and advancing our understanding. So uh, now I'm talking briefly about a European Digital Innovation Hub uh, named Finnish AI Region. Why do we need Finnish AI region? So um, SMEs typically need some help in terms of expertise and resources when they want to integrate AI into their actual products or better business processes. So that's why we established Finnish AI region consortium to put together the offering, what we have in Helsinki region in Finland. And this way we are able to offer kind of one-stop shopping for those SME companies who already have existing operations, existing business, and who are thinking of integrating AI somehow in a way or another but they are having lack of own expertise lack of resources lack of time lack of money all these typical typical challenges so this is the situation when fair consortium is there to help SME companies so if there are any people online who represent sme companies you are welcome to join and become our customer. So we are happy to help both Finnish customers and also some SME companies outside Finland, any country within Europe. So you are welcome. Who we are within the FAIR consortium. So on the left hand side, you can see the organizations behind and we are gathering together expertise and resources from all these organizations and provide suitable services to SME companies. And we figure it out case by case for every single company, what could be the feasible approach to help them in the best way. And what do we actually offer? These other services, uh, it consists of set of advisory services on the left hand side, uh, training services, which are actually open to everyone to join concept development support, type of services, solution development support, experimentation and test beds, networking and support to find investments. So many kinds of services. And regarding the SME companies outside Finland, I would invite you to start from advisory services. So this could be the lowest threshold to collaborate with us and with our experts like Umer, who was talking in this webinar. And these advisory services include a variety of things. Uh, the first point needs analysis. It's uh, one session with AI researchers where we dig into the actual use case with SME company experts and figure out the, what is the need in terms of technical point of view, but also the business situation, what kind of support the company might need. Then usually next step is the advisory services where we have variety of things for example, advisory services for AI technologies like LLMs. Researchers are helping SME company to figure out possible technologies, resources available and do trialing together to help them advancing in their own development path. We also have so having advisory services for a business perspective AI business related advisory 
uh, which is focusing especially the uh, change and the impact the company wants to make for their customers. What kind of change in customers' daily operations and practices they want to make happen, and then we figure out how to manage that kind of change and help the customer to get out the benefits which are possibly available there to gain. Uh, later on, there are many other services. If the SME company, the customer company is proceeding in their development, uh, the FAIR consortium also provides a variety of testbed services, access to uh, health, city of Helsinki, city of Espoo and Vanta, resources like uh, traffic lights or schools or even hospitality environments for healthcare services, for example. Many kinds of testbed environments are accessible through fair office. And some kind of public data steering is also, also possible. For example, air quality measurements, some kind of health health services data, and so on. Uh, this is the fair services in brief. And if there are any, any uh, potential SME customer people online, so please contact us. Uh, you will find more information at fairedish.fi. Thank you very much. Any questions, uh, comments? Maybe Lily okay. takes the. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thanks. I think I I have a question for for Timo Kaski, anyways. Uh, but uh, let's see the chat to make sure that in the in the chat there's no question. And now you can also think while I'm asking. So I'm now thinking especially about um, some European SME um, that would like to to maybe have some services uh, in our fair and and who is maybe willing to network in in Finland with the companies and and with the research institutions so what would in practice be the first step that this company should take in order to to come here and to become to be able to take advantage of the both the services but also the net all the networking events that fair organizes Yeah, thank you for the good question. So, uh, yeah, the first step is that uh, the person has to go to the website of the fairedish.fi, and there you will find a form to fill. You have to fill in the very brief, short form uh, to become a, a fair customer, and that information comes to fair office where we have a, a meeting practice called new customer review. We review all the forms coming in, and if the company fulfills the uh, requirements set by a funder, the EU Commission, uh, then we are able to serve that company. And then we nominate one person from her office to be a customer manager for that company, and he or she will then contact you, and you will figure out how do we start? How do we start? And usually we start with needs analysis session with with AI experts, and then the customer manager is the one who leads you forward based on your actual needs. Okay, thank you very much for the answer. And and the website is uh, shared with you at the moment. It's in the screen. You have you have the website. So this is this is the address where you should go. So I'm I'm answering to the question here because it's very evident. So yes, that's the one. Thank you, William O'Gorman, for posting it uh, for us. So that is 
Uh, yes, and and I think, well, as far as I know, um, the founder of the European Commission um, uh, has in the rules that we also can serve European uh, companies, but about other company, other other places in, on earth, <laughs> I don't know. So this is something that uh, you could send a brief message to Tivo Kaski, who was just here. He's asking about other other continents than Europe, if other continents can be served, companies there. Uh, well, yeah, basically, EU Commission is funding the project, so they, they expect to serve European companies uh, and still there are possibilities, certain possibilities for other companies outside Europe, for example, some of the training courses are online and there is a fair uh, training portal website, which William just added on chat. So you will find uh, possible online courses over there. Yeah, thank you. Okay, okay, thanks. Thank you, Timo Kaski, and also, of course, these webinars you can find on our web pages. So these are also open to to uh, to members like you because you are now here. So, so um, I guess it's now time to wrap up this very uh, inspiring discussion talk, session with you, and. Um, and also this whole webinar, joint webinar of the Ulusseus AI Innovation Hub for Business and, and, uh, and Learning, Business and Education, and then of 